What I remember most about Season 5 Voyager is the discussion among many Star Trek fans that it was time to bring Voyager home. What they were doing was so disconnected from the idea of a ship stranded far from home with no support or backup, with their mixed crew being a non-issue for almost every single episode, with the fight of the week being a minor inconvenience easily sorted out despite them supposedly having no allies or space docks. It just seemed time to bring them back and do their thing in the Alpha Quadrant, to not only justify all the reset buttons they hit every episode, but to also give them something new to work with, like handling the post-Dominion War fallout, or Janeway having to do less of her own initiative and more having to carry out assignments that she's ordered to do. But that's not what happened. Instead, as Season 5 neared an end and they were trying to decide what this season's cliffhanger would be, they seem to once again want to remind what the show was supposed to be about, rather than have it be about that thing. Equinox, a Starfleet science vessel currently under some kind of attack, led by the comfortingly named Captain Ransom, and played by the even more comfortingly named John Savage, is dealing with the fact that their shields are failing, so he orders them to drop the shields completely to start the recharge cycle, but that will mean vulnerability for 45 seconds. But they pick up their guns, which means they're not expecting an attack on the ship itself, but rather inside this very room. And sure enough, gateways open, and they begin to shoot the gateways. Because as we've established, the first instinct of a scientifically trained, highly enlightened graduate of Starfleet Academy, when they see a hole in space, is shoot it. But out of the gateway swoops some creature, and it looks like Slimer has discovered Atkins. Uh, the skinny little alien swoops in and turns one guy into a mummy. Certainly an intriguing teaser. When we return, Seven shows Janeway and Chakotay a recording of Ransom's distress call, and Janeway says it's bad news for them because the Equinox is a Nova-class starship made for short-term scientific studies, not for running across the galaxy while the captain's making goo-goo eyes at an Irish barkeep or something. While talking with Seven, Janeway reveals that she's always kind of admired him, which of course explains... Were there any other reports of missing starships? Not to my knowledge. That she didn't even give a crap that he'd gone missing. They rendezvous with the Equinox while they're still being bombarded, so when Ransom pleads to surround Equinox with Voyager's shields, Janeway quickly has them do that. During the brief time when they're getting ready to do it, there's a weird high-pitched whine which is either a sign of alien invasion or that Neelix has discovered someone raided the pantry again. The shields put an end to it, so they beam over to the Equinox to check out the condition of things, and it's pretty grim. For starters, someone seems to have turned the warp core into a microbrewery. Also, we discover that the Equinox crew is jerkied. The guy they find has been completely desiccated. There's not a trace of water in his entire body. So they start looking for crew members, which operates under the same rules as finding small puppies. Whoever finds who gets stuck with that person following them around for the rest of the story. Chakotay finds this blonde engineer under some fallen crap, and Harry finds this guy under even worse crap, but he knows what's up and quickly assigns Seven to take over the role of having found him. Harry knows that if he becomes a major player in this episode, he's just going to wind up with half his fluids sucked out and spend the cliffhanger over in sickbay. Talk to him. Keep him calm. To help you keep calm while you're completely helpless, I've decided to leave you alone with a Borg. You're welcome. Down below, one poor bastard has been stuck in this room, bombarded by hostile aliens for who knows how long, starved, exhausted, years trapped on the cramped ship. The only comfort he has is knowing, hey, it could be worse. He could have been stuck with odious alien comic relief. Oh. Help you. Thank you. Poor bastard. Didn't even know when he had it so good. Janeway's finally found Ransom on the bridge, who insists that he be treated here, on his bridge. But Janeway demands that he return to their sick bay, despite you know, all the times that she said exactly the same thing, or just flat out refused to be treated at all. When I do it, it's bold necessity. When anyone else does it, it's flagrant stupidity. Uh, perhaps there's some comfort to be offered. So, how's Earth? I wish I could say. I'm just kidding. Comfort is the rewarding of weakness. They have a brief funeral for the fallen in the mess hall, but now it's time to get down to business. The aliens have been attacking the Equinox for weeks, so she's in rough shape and is going to need fixing. But it also means they have tons of data on what they're up against. So it's time for what they do best, tech tech, until we have a technobabble solution to the problem. There's also an added wrinkle to the character dynamics. The first officer, Maxwell, is Tora's ex-boyfriend from the Academy days, so Tom's a little jealous. 
Don't worry, them fighting over this would have the shippers up in arms, so aside of looking uncomfortable for this scene, that will go nowhere. But you're probably not surprised to find that out. As I mentioned before, it was often the habit in Star Trek to come up with the first half of the cliffhanger with no idea of where it was going. So you'd often have setups that would be forgotten by the time Part 2 came around. The only way their past relationship matters is that Torres helped teach Max a lot of engineering stuff, and he gives her the annoying nickname of BLT. Well, turkey platter, what do you say we go to work? Harry Kim, where funny goes to die. Meanwhile, blonde engineer goes to Chakotay to request assignment to Voyager's teams instead of the Equinox, since she's got a bit of shell shock after all those weeks of being terrorized by aliens. Such a clean ship, I'm used to falling bulkheads and missing deck plates. What's it like living in a world without consequences? She likes the idea of that so much she asks if perhaps she could be assigned a Voyager permanently. I don't think your captain would appreciate that. He's got a skeleton crew as it is. Ah, uh, more of a mummy crew than a skeleton crew. She's so severely affected by this that she can't even stand being in the turbo lift for long. The fear of being in a confined space when Slimer shows up has given her claustrophobia. Though I don't know if it qualifies as an irrational fear if being in tight spaces can indeed be a death sentence. The only advantage the humans have is that the aliens can't survive longer than a few seconds in our reality before returning to their own. So the plan is to devise a way to catch and hold them once they enter, so that they'll get the message that attacking is suicide. This is Maxwell's suggestion, played by Titus Welliver, who, when not doing action scenes, plays the part like he's narrating an episode of Modern Marvels. They actually have a multiphasic force field apparatus they use to examine one of the aliens, but it's in the research lab, and there's way too much radiation to go in there, unlike, say, the surface of that planet with 6,000 isorems from Friendship 1 that they just merrily strolled around on, though we still don't know what an isorem is. I like the suggestion someone gave that ISO is just their way of dropping the F-bomb. It does cause a lot of these scenes to make more sense. So while they head off to get the schematics, Janeway feels the need to comment on the way Ransom runs his command. I couldn't help but notice your crew calls you by your first name. Yeah, you'd almost think the crew had become a family, huh? They also trade notes on baddies. The first week after their arrival, the Equinox ran into aliens. And of course, it was not the Kazon, because that would make sense. Half the crew was lost against these aliens, and after that it was downhill, the crew having to struggle day to day to survive. It's meant breaking a few rules along the way. The Prime Directive. How often have you broken it for the sake of protecting your crew? Broken it? Never. Bent it on occasion. Oh, come on. You bent over backwards to justify doing it those times when you did which I wouldn't mind if you weren't so judgmental and thick-headed when there were lives at stake in other situations. The fact that you felt that exploiting a species demanded interference when planetary annihilation is just met with a shrug? Well, that explains what we're soon going to get. Janeway talks about protocol and regulations, but most of the time she just does whatever the hell she wants and rationalizes it away while the script gods all tell us that this was the way things would work out for the best. Anyway, they find the Equinox plaque on the floor to put back up, but while Janeway says it's a good omen, she doesn't realize that that's actually a metaphor. The plaque has fallen because Ransom himself has fallen, as hinted at in a private meeting with Maxwell, where he's convinced that Janeway will never understand doing what is necessary to survive in the face of certain death. And he's right. Janeway is quick with speeches about Federation ideals, except for the times when she's justifying her plans when they conflict with Federation ideals. We'd be helping the Borg assimilate yet another species just to get ourselves back home. It's wrong! Tell that to Harry Kim. He's barely alive thanks to that species. Maybe helping to assimilate them isn't such a bad idea. We could be doing the Delta Quadrant a favor. Speaking of Scorpion, let's get back to Seven, who's with Noah now, because he was imprinted on her during the rescue and all that. You might recognize his voice, if not his appearance, because he was Snarf over on Enterprise. But rather than tiring us with their banter, they have a little escalation of tension as the aliens focus their attacks so that the shields drop in one area briefly. So after that pants-filling interruption, it's time to step up the game. They can make their multiphasic defense system work, but it will take 14 hours to implement on both ships. So it's suggested that they focus only on Voyager, which sounds reasonable. And so they'll totally abandon the Equinox forever, which sounds stupid. True, the aliens may start trashing the Equinox out of spite, but the entire plan is really to convince the aliens that attacking just isn't worth it. 
So why not just wait until things die down, then install it on the Equinox at that point just to be on the safe side? Because having a second ship would have been invaluable lots of times. So it's worth gambling holding on to it. Not to mention that it's a ransom ship. Joey can't just decide to start stripping it for parts. Oh, no, oh, my mistake. I shouldn't have said can't to Janeway. Starfleet Regulation 191, Article 14. In a combat situation involving more than one ship, command falls to the vessel of tactical superiority. I looked it up this morning. Why am I not surprised that your to-do list included finding a way to pull rank even to someone of equal rank? Obviously, the spirit of this regulation is for space combat engagement, one vessel to order the plan of attack. But Janeway will apply the strict letter of the regulations. Aliens are attacking, thus it's combat. And command means I can unscrew every damn toilet on the Equinox and beam it on board if I want to. Please remember this philosophy. It's going to be important later on. And do note that by depriving Ransom of his ship during the combat situation, it will ensure that even after the crisis passes, that Janeway will be in command. A move that would have been right up parody Janeway's alley, except this plan didn't allow her to thump anyone. And really, as an aside, I find it hard to believe that stripping the Equinox like a chop shop would take less time than installing a security upgrade would. Even updating Norton doesn't take that long. Let's start with your dilithium crystals. Mm, what we have left of them. I'm afraid we only have a few isograms. Now, there's no need for that language. She suggests that perhaps instead of dismantling it, they should focus on supplies. Although that makes abandoning the Equinox make even less sense. But it's the end of Season 5, so hey, why start now? They spend some time mentioning a few of the other horrors that they've run into. And if you think the Voyager crew is probably thinking, Wow, that had to be rough. I don't know what we'd have done if we had to go through that kind of stuff. Well, congratulations on having put more thought into this than those working on the episode. Because the sympathy over Ransom's dark secret and the actions of the crew is going to amount to jack squat. Holodecks, potlucks, talent nights, sonic showers, warm beds, and fresh uniforms. These people should be amazed at how lucky they've been by comparison. But nope! You'll get to see that next time when their deep dark secret is revealed. At the end of Alliances, Janeway gave a speech about how sticking to the principles of the Federation was their best way of ensuring they would get home. And of course they did and everything worked out. Because it's the only message the show has. Those who do the wrong thing are bad and will come to a bad end. Except Ransom tried the same thing, and half his crew died in the first week. His harsh lesson was that the right thing doesn't mean that you automatically get to live. It often means you'll be giving those who do the wrong things an advantage. Thus why he can ask the question, and Janeway can so casually dismiss that question. That protocol was written in the Alpha Quadrant. I'm not so sure that it makes much sense out here. The regulation stands. Ransom's assembled his senior staff, Maxwell, Noah, and Blonde Engineer, to discuss how to steal the special shield generator. Maxwell had gotten all the info while sweet-talking Torres. The others want to stay with Voyager, but Ransom is convinced they're ready to go home. They just need to see this through a little longer. But Seven's already noticed something odd. The radiation in the lab didn't dissipate. Someone deliberately rerouted stuff so that it would stay flooded with radiation. So they decide to send the doctor over to investigate, and he finds the remains of one of the aliens in a chamber, which the music and cut to commercial says is ominous. You know, even though the Equinox crew had already said they caught one of the aliens, and that they die when they're caught, so it's kind of like the same shocking reveal that shows Janeway has a coffee mug. But the answer is eventually revealed. They were up to no good, trademark. It looks like they were breaking down the aliens' tissues into some kind of material, probably to serve as a fuel source or possibly to make gas station hot dogs. Well, this revelation requires a conversation with Ransom, and of course, all conversations with Janeway require several people with weapons drawn. Janeway reveals what she knows, that the reason for the attack is in response to what Ransom did, capturing and killing the aliens to serve as a fuel supply. Ransom, I want you to know one thing. I am disgusted with you. You did the worst possible thing imaginable for a Starfleet captain to do. You got caught. Now, let me be clear. What Ransom did was a terrible thing. I am not trying to say what he did was right. And he certainly does owe it to Voyager's crew because, well, they would be dead right now if they hadn't come along. And it will probably seem like I've got an axe to grind here, but having seen all that I have seen, 
It just seems to me Janeway is not the person to pass judgment on anybody in this situation. Starfleet Regulation 3, Paragraph 12. In the event of imminent destruction, a captain is authorized to preserve the lives of his crew by any justifiable means. Regulation, point, set, and match. She may not like it, but it all hinged on what is justifiable, and that would fall under the purview of the captain, likely for review by Starfleet Command, not someone in temporary command of a fleet during a combat situation. But... I doubt that protocol covers mass murder. In my judgment, it did. Unacceptable. Perhaps. But the same regulations that say that Janeway can order Ransom's crew to abandon their only home for the past five years and leave it behind says that Ransom doesn't have to answer to her for what he's done. But he does explain what happened to them. They were broken down, helpless, and completely out of power and food. But the system they had reached had friendly aliens, and during the ceremonies, they used this special sacred pencil holder to summon some aliens which give off antimatter, spirits of good fortune, which they would have to be since the observers didn't die almost immediately from the antimatter hitting all the matter in the cave. They built the containment unit only to observe it, not knowing that it would die. When they realized, though, that it could be used as a fuel source, well, they used it, and thanks to that discovery, they were able to travel 10,000 light years in weeks. I'll get into this in a moment, but suffice to say that for Janeway, it's absurdly black and white. It's easy to cling to principles when you're standing on a vessel with its bulkheads intact, manned by a crew that's not starving. It's never easy. What a fucking sanctimoniously pat line. You know, it's never easy to run a marathon, but it's certainly unimaginably hard when you've got a broken leg. Not to mention Janeway will kill to get home. We just need the courage to see this through to the end. There are other kinds of courage, like the courage to accept that there are some situations beyond your control. Not every problem has an immediate solution. You're suggesting we turn around? Yes. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. We should get out of harm's way. Let them fight it out. In the meantime, there's still plenty of Delta Quadrant left to explore. We may find another way home. Oh, we might find something else. Six months? A year down the road? Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. How much is our safety worth? What do you mean? We'd be giving an advantage to a race guilty of murdering billions. We'd be helping the Borg assimilate yet another species just to get ourselves back home. It's wrong! Or launch an unprovoked attack. We're going to steal a transwarp coil. Think it might come in handy? I know, I know. Species 8472 had it coming. That's why we had to side with the Borg. Until it was more convenient to steal their stuff. Okay, how about resistance then, where instead of approaching the legitimate government of that world, Janeway instead had the crew land in secret and actually make a trade with a resistance movement against that very government. Or Nothing Human, where Janeway ordered them to use knowledge attained through mass murder to treat Torres. Need I go on? All of these are instances of her making a choice for the sake of her crew. And I'm not saying that she was wrong to do them, don't misunderstand that. I'll admit, I probably would have done the same thing in those cases that she did. What I'm saying, though, is that once you've had to rationalize away your own morally questionable decisions because you were desperate to get home, if they were decisions that were made with a full crew that had fully functioning systems backing them up, how can you expect to pass moral judgment on someone in even worse straits making the same kind of decisions? And that's why... Well, I don't want to give everything away just yet, but... One last thing. Please, show them leniency. They were only following my orders. Their mistake. Yes, when the crew follows the captain's orders instead of following their conscience, they're punished. And if they refuse to follow Janeway's orders because they're following their conscience, they're also punished. See Scorpion, 30 Days, or just part two of this story. Now again, I am not siding with Ransom here. But I think it should be noted that Janeway has backed him into a corner here. She is using a barely applicable rule to justify taking control, is using that to force him to abandon his ship against his will, is enforcing her decisions literally at gunpoint, and has now decreed that his entire crew will be locked away for decades with no sign of leniency. Put another way, Let's say that this was right after Scorpion, and it wasn't the puny Equinox out there, but the Enterprise-E meaning that Picard is the one in charge. 
Would Janeway allow Voyager to be lost and her and her crew to be locked away because Picard finds aiding their mortal enemy and even developing and using biological weapons in a war that she knew little about to be a betrayal of Starfleet principles? Do you see her sitting quietly in the brig for the next 30 years? Would you expect her to try to escape back to her ship with her crew as Ransom will? Because I don't doubt for a minute that she would. And that's the problem I have. All those decisions that she's justified to herself, including ones she's claimed were for the almighty prime directive, the highest federation principle, because, of course, you can't play God. You can't interfere in other people's affairs because you don't know what the consequences will be. You negotiated an agreement with the Borg Collective. Did it ever occur to you that there were those of us in the Delta Quadrant with a vested interest in that war? Victory would have meant annihilation of the Borg, but you couldn't see beyond the bow of your own ship. I'm not seeing where you're going with this. In my estimation, Species 8472 posed a greater threat than the Borg. Who are you to make that decision? A stranger to this quadrant. There wasn't exactly time to take a poll. I had to act quickly. This should really be placed in textbooks on diplomacy, so people know what not to do. Species 8472 was our last hope to defeat them. You took that away from us! I'm sorry for what happened to your people, but try to understand. I couldn't have known. All I'm saying is, once your self-serving compromising of your most ideal principle leads to the complete annihilation of at least one other race, you've kind of lost the moral high ground. Logical? Perfectly. But what I was specifically asked to comment on is the morality of the situation, to which I guess I have to clarify my point of view that differs from some, that to me there's a difference between the moral thing to do and the right thing to do sometimes. I mention that because some don't agree with that, but that's the approach that I take. Now we know it would take 63 more aliens uh, being killed to get home. Voyager has traveled a little over halfway, so I think that we can say that at a maximum there have been 60 aliens killed so far. A lot of it, people interpreted his line to mean that they got 10,000 light years out of the one alien, but that would contradict how many he says he still needs. So I think it was just explaining how this superfuel lets them travel unimaginably fast. I'm reminded of the Joker's plot in The Dark Knight. Adapting it here, you're on a bus, a bus that's half full, and there's another bus that is completely full, and you are given a choice by a terrorist. Blow up the other bus, or he will blow up your bus. Now, your bus contains all of the people that you love and care about, all of the people whose safety you are responsible for. You also learn that that may not actually be people on the other bus. It could be rats over there, too. You don't know for sure. It could be one or the other. Would I push the button in that situation where I'm the only one who can do that? I'm the only one that can make the decision of whether these people I care about or others who may or may not even be people at all get to live. I'll admit that I probably would. Of course, I'm not a Starfleet officer, but then I also haven't spent a half a decade watching people I was responsible for die either. Now, of course, it's not quite the same thing, and I don't just mean that later we have confirmation that they are intelligent, since they know to focus their attacks and that they actually have a language. It's not one push of a button. It's one at a time, over and over. And it required ordering the crew to be culpable in that. At the same time, looking at episodes like the Siege of AR-558, seeing how living under constant terror without relief or resources, not for days or weeks, but for years with no end in sight, and one day to have the answer fall into your laps to end all of that forever as the devil whispers in your ear, salvation. Just reach out and take it. Wring the life from its tiny body and I'll give you everything you ever wanted. Sacrifice another life on that altar you built to me and lose a little bit of your humanity with each victim. But humanity won't get you home. I will. And what's the worst that will happen? You'll be court-martialed? <laughs> You'd trade your mother for the comfort of a Federation penal colony compared to what this is, wouldn't you? I can't think it's moral. I'm not even sure I can think it's right. But I think it's a temptation that few in Ransom's position could possibly resist. 
Now, some might point out that Ransom pushed to go home rather than stay on Voyager when his crew wanted to, which could suggest that Ransom's not giving into temptation to do a, you know, a terrible but necessary thing. He just doesn't care. But at the same time, despite Voyager looking ludicrously pristine for the circumstances, they are still stranded out here. And having mentioned multiple encounters with the Borg, well, that doesn't set a person's mind at ease that things are going to be easy going from now on. In essence, it's kind of like joining the prison settlement in The Walking Dead. It sure as hell beats being stuck in the wilderness, but you're only safer. You're not actually safe. And comparing safety with just a little safer? Well, I'm not surprised that finding out the way that Janeway runs her ship, that Ransom would choose to take his chances trying to get back his way. One last thing before we get back to the episode. While it may have been that the creators were 100% in agreement with Janeway, I'll say that even if it wasn't intended, it gave us a great thing that Voyager rarely did. Two options in a situation where both were bad and there is no third way out. Because for Ransom, it was either stay true to your principles and lead your crew right into their graves. Or find a way out of this hell at the cost of becoming a mass murderer. Janeway's it's never easy concept speaks volumes about her naivete in comprehending how endless suffering can erode the human spirit and make the unthinkable seem reasonable. She's effectively comparing five years of hopelessness and loss and starvation with having to handle an ornery diplomat. The decision is not so easy when people look to you for answers and the only one you have demands your soul as payment. Not everyone has her ability to look at a desperate crew and look them straight in the eye and tell them they'll die for her principles. And honestly, I think it says more about her than it does about Ransom. Well, they want more info on how to communicate with the aliens. So in addition to getting help from Blonde Engineer, uh, sorry to keep calling her that, but I only heard her name once and it was in Maxwell's droning voice, so I kind of nodded off. And so they're sending the doctor over also, and he activates their EMH, and is only too happy to spill how he's got a mobile emitter. After all, how else is he going to explain how he could be in another ship's sick bay, one with a hollow projector in it? So when the Equinox EMH reveals his ethical subroutines were lost, he knocks out the doctor and swipes it, and takes his place on Voyager. So he fills a med kit with phasers and lets himself into them on the pretense of treating a virus, so they can now escape and swipe the new shield generator. Bad form, certainly. But that's part of what I mean by saying Ransom has been backed into a corner here. If Janeway had let them return to their ship like they wanted to, instead of just dumping it in space just cause, they would have been able to build their own instead of needing to swipe Voyagers. But that obviously pisses Janeway off anyway. Stealing technology from other people is wrong, unless I do it. To make matters worse for Voyager, Seven was analyzing the engine modifications that allowed them to use the converted biomatter as fuel. This was so they could learn how to talk with the aliens, you know, much like if you wanted to learn English, you'd examine how a crematorium works. So Morla, blonde engineer, I finally found her name, stuns her so that the Equinox can take off and she's brought along for the ride, while Voyager's left behind shooting the fissures and cliffhanger. I'm afraid. 